all-time classic. North Carolina top Duke, 81-77. I think it's appropriate to start with the nightcap. Duke led at the half, led with 61 seconds remaining, but North Carolina closed on an 8-3 run in the final 61 seconds, highlighted by six points from Caleb Love and Hubert Davis's Tar Heels. They beat Mike Krzyzewski's Blue Devils for the second time in a month to end Coach K's legendary career in an all-time great national semifinal, arguably the greatest national semifinal in history given the stakes. I was on set for CBS Sports Network just outside the Superdome. Kyle, you were inside. What was it like to witness that instant classic in person? Chaos. People in the building, I think for probably the last 15 minutes of this game, were standing. And the tension was palpable. You could see it in the stands. You could feel it in the building. And you could see it even in on the on the Duke bench, especially. To me, I thought that was most notable. I, I had a seat just across from the Duke bench. And Coach K is obviously, he's got his stool. And he's up and he's down and he's up and he's down. And he's always like that. But the entire Duke assistant staff just living and dying on every shot late in this game. You could feel the stakes were obviously high, and it's the final four. This is obviously huge stakes. Um, it's it's Coach K's final game as a college basketball coach. But um, just being in the building just, I think, kind of elevated just how big a moment this was. It's Duke, North Carolina, the first time they've ever met in the NCAA tournament. And this game was, was just a classic. I mean, there was 18 different lead changes, 12 ties, back and forth, all the way down to the wire. Caleb Love was awesome in this game and finished with 28 points, had the dagger three-pointer with about 25 seconds left. Um, he's He's been really good in this NCAA tournament, but those were kind of my overall takeaways, just being in the building uh, watching this game. You know, Caleb Love had already had a 30-point game in this NCAA tournament to lead a come-from-behind win to help North Carolina get to this point, and then he, he turns this one in, uh, which was, you know, that's legendary stuff. To go, I believe you said it was 28. I think that's what it was, 28 points. Uh, to go 28 points in the game that ends Mike Krzyzewski's career, I mean, what? And um, I had written a column, very short column. I, I'm hesitant to even call it a column. But I had typed some words. I guess it was last Saturday night around 2 in the morning. I popped into our Slack uh, just to see what was up, because when I'm in studio, I, I can sort of there's a lot of people going at it in there, and I can sort of lose track of what's what. So I was, you know, sort of scrolling through it, and I saw um, a question from from one of our bosses, and it was like it, it, for the for the Duke haters, not for everybody, and certainly not for me. I'm not a Duke hater. I never have been, but for the Duke haters, like if you are if you somebody who who identifies as a anti Coach K anti Duke person, what would be the more hilarious ending to Coach K's career? Would it be, because remember at the time, North Carolina and St. Peter's still had to play on Sunday. Would it be St. Peter's upsetting Duke in the Final Four? The Peacocks? I'm not going to do it. Or would it be uh, North Carolina eliminating uh, Duke from the Final Four and, and ending Coach K's career? And I said it would be North Carolina. From that perspective, it would be North Carolina, there's no doubt. And then the next thing I saw typed was, hey, could you could you write that? And I was like, you know what? I'm so tired. But, yeah, I, I guess I could – I'm probably not falling asleep for another 90 minutes. I could knock this out, and so I did. And the, the point I made is that if you are a Duke hater or a North Carolina fan and you are interested in being able to tease Duke forever or at least for the foreseeable future, like you got to think of the way it would have played out. Option one, St. Peter's beats Duke in the Final Four. All right, that's wild. I mean, it would be the wildest story in the history of the sport if St. Peter's were getting ready to play Kansas Monday night for the national title. But if you're a Carolina fan, how much fun can you have with that, given that the only way St. Peter's would have ever played Duke in the Final Four is to beat you, right? And if you're a Kentucky fan, which makes you an anti-Duke person, how much fun can you have with that, given that St. Peter's beat you too? So... The two schools, best I can tell from social media, that hate Duke the most are Kentucky and North Carolina. And the only way St. Peter's could have played Duke in the Final Four is to beat both Kentucky and North Carolina. So I thought that took some of the sting. Out. It's a little bit like the, ha, 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 you lost to St. Peter's in the Final Four. Like, oh, yeah? Well, you lost to them in the Elite Eight. 
and you lost to him in the first round. So what, what's the, we all lost to him. What's the joke? But for North Carolina to do this, I, it's why I thought this was the clear option. If you were trying to identify what would be most hilarious for uh, an anti-Duke person, um, because you now, against all odds, I mean, nobody would have thought this any of this was even possible on the morning of the second Duke-UNC game at Cameron. But you end uh, Coach K's career at Cameron Indoor with a double-digit win that has him furious. Um, you know, even though he came back out after that game and spoke to the crowd, you could tell he was seething. But as he said, the season's not over. Hey, this stinks. I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, in fact, I'm sort of just saying what I think he was thinking. This sucks. This is terrible. I can't believe this just happened. But the season's not over. The season's is not the end of our season. And then they go to the Final Four. And what an achievement. 13 Final Fours most of all the time for Coach K. Don't, get, don't let that get lost. But then you end up playing that same North Carolina team, your rival, in the Final Four, and they beat you again. And they end your career. Two of Coach K's final three losses will have come to North Carolina. And though nothing is forever, I've heard a little bit of this about Duke, uh, you know, North Carolina fans will have bragging rights over Duke forever. And Duke fans can't say anything for a while. Um, I agree with the latter. They're going to have to shut up for a while because this is always going to be the the counterpunch. But uh, I don't know about forever, but certainly for a while. If you're a North Carolina fan, Getting to the championship game is a thrill every time, no matter what. But to do it under these circumstances, I, I can't imagine anything better. Yeah, and and when North Carolina did take out Duke in the regular season finale, what was Coach K's final home game, it felt a little bit fluky, right? Because Duke was a pretty heavy favorite. Just not long before that, North Carolina was flirting with the NCAA tournament bubble. They ended up getting in as, as a number eight seed. Uh, but this this to me kind of validated that like North Carolina, what they did in the back half of the season was for real. Like they they've now won 17 of their last 20 games. And yes, they are a number eight seed. They're only the fifth number eight seed to advance to the title game in NCAA tournament history. Only one of those has ever gone on and won it. That was trivia time. Do you remember? You know this. Repeat the question. There's five number eight seeds to ever advance the title game in, in NCAA tournament history. The lowest. Um, Okay, I got to in the bracket. Who, who went and won it? Yeah. Okay, you know Villanova, Villanova 85. Yes. Is one. Yep. I want to say one of the Butler teams, the second mm-hmm. Butler team maybe, yep. was one. Was was a Kentucky team with the Harrison Twins one of them? You are correct. Okay, so that's three. I got two more to go? Yes. I think I'm out. Well, of you've, got, you, you've got one more. I got one more to go. Yeah. Hmm. One more eight seed advance. Oh, was it Kimba? No. No, because they were like a four seed or something. They moved up pretty good because of that run yeah. to the biggest tournament. Okay, no, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna let you take it. Yeah, it's it's uh 1988 UCLA. Okay. They I would have never it. guessed that. Yeah, I, I would have yeah, never guessed that. But like it's an incredible achievement for uh an eight seed to ever get here. Evidence being you, you just trivia timed it and it's 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 very, it's extremely rare. Yes. Um, but, and I've made this point a million times over the past week, so forgive me. Um, you know, my, my buddy Chris Walker, uh, former Villanova star and Villanova assistant and was the interim head coach at Texas Tech once upon a time. You know, we were on set tonight and he was talking about, you know, North Carolina getting the title game, upsetting Duke again. And he said, all right, let's forget about, he's always goofing on me about Ken Palm and Torvik and he's just, they, they, you know, he, he he's always goofing. I love him, but he's always goofing. And he's like, let's just throw Ken Palm out the window and all the computers out the window because this is what happens when you play basketball. The computers don't always know what's going to happen. The point I had made over the past week, and again, I made on CBS Sports Network to counter Seawalk, was um, at BartTorvik.com for the past six weeks, North Carolina had been the seventh best team in the country. Four spots better than Duke. Now, that doesn't mean that North Carolina deserved a higher seed than Duke or the same seed as Duke, or it doesn't mean anything other than what I just said. For the past six weeks, which is like an extended, that's not a small sample size. Six weeks is six weeks. That's when your report cards come, I think. (laughs) But 
Like, they, like for six weeks now, North Carolina has not been playing like an eight seed. North Carolina losing, you know, by 17 to Tennessee, getting blown out by Kentucky, getting blown out five times by the time they lost to Duke that first time. That's why North Carolina was an eight seed. But North Carolina has not been playing like an eight seed for about six weeks at least. And don't forget, North Carolina was a preseason top 20 team because they got five stars on that roster. They uh, capitalized on the transfer portal, and it took them a while to get it together. But they finally got it together. I'm not going to have revisionist history here. I didn't think North Carolina would get to the Final Four or the title game. I didn't think North Carolina would beat Duke on Saturday night. But none of it's crazy when you focus on what I just said. Yeah, and after the game, um, Huber Davis, obviously North Carolina's coach, talked a little bit about what makes them so lethal, North Carolina. And he said, the beauty for us is that we have a number of guys that can shoot threes. We have a number of guys who can shoot the ball. Our emphasis is to attack the basket. We want to feed the ball to Armando. I feel like working inside out is the way for successful basketball. And he went on to talk a little bit about how just how balanced this team is, right? I mean, Caleb Love has 28 points tonight. He's had 30 in this NCAA tournament. RJ Davis, who finished this game with 18 points and seven rebounds, has also had a 30 burger in this NCAA tournament. Brady Manick had 14 points tonight. He had games of 26 points and 28 points earlier in this NCAA tournament. Armand, Armando Baycott, 21 rebounds tonight, 11 points. So there are, there are so many ways that this North Carolina – team can beat you both inside and out and i think that is what makes like yes they're going against duke the all talented duke with five potential first round picks right but just the balance that they have any given night someone can step up tonight it was caleb love um brady manic was really big but monday night who knows who it's going to be and that's kind of the beauty of what makes north carolina such a tough scout and obviously for duke such a tough matchup I want to give Hubert Davis some credit uh, because, you know, I believe they, you know, once they lost to Duke in Chapel Hill, got blown out. I mean, they were down. It, like, we were starting to wonder, are they going to lose by 40? And they only lost by 20, but it was bad. They were never competitive. The game was never a game. And it was either after that game or shortly after it. Um, I, I wrote a column sort of. I don't even remember what it was exactly about other than my God, North Carolina just got ran off the court again, but there was a portion of it that, um, you know, focused on the fact, because it's a fact that some North Carolina fans were starting to question, like, did we get this right? Like everybody loves Hubert Davis. He's genuinely like uh, the, the nicest guy in the world. Um, and when, you know, they decide to go from Roy Williams to Hubert. I think everybody is is hopeful that it'll go well. But the truth is, you don't know if it'll go well. You're just hopeful that it'll go well. And it didn't get off to a great start. That was obvious. And I sort of pointed out, like, you know, people are asking big questions now. And perhaps it's too early. But, you know, this is not going well. And, and it's impossible to, to argue otherwise. And now he's coaching in the national championship game. So every coach who has a rough November, December, January, and even early February going forward is going to be able to point to this story forever and say, hey, it's not too late to turn it around. Remember what Carolina did in 2022. But there are two decisions he made um, that run completely counter to decisions that Roy Williams either made last season or would have made throughout his career that I think have helped North Carolina get to this point. The first one, and I wrote about this one very early on because I saw Carolina – I was on sideline for a Carolina game, you know, back in November or December, non-conference uh, portion of the schedule. And, you know, I talked to Hubert about it um, in advance of the game, about how he decided we're not playing two traditional bigs anymore. Mm-hmm. Like Roy Williams forever had played two traditional bigs. Like last year it was Armando Baycott and Garrison Brooks, which is why Walker Kessler couldn't get on the court, which right. seems wild in with the benefit of hindsight, but it's a true story. Um uh, Hubert just said, I want space. I'm going to priori- prioritize space and shooting. So we're not playing two traditional bigs anymore. We're going to, you know, have a stretch four. And that stretch four, you know, largely turned into um, Brady Manick, who's yep. been terrific. Um, early in the season, I think even, you know, middle of the season, it really 
uh, you know, showed um, some deficiencies. Like Carolina consistently under Roy was one of the best offensive rebounding teams in America every year with few exceptions. And, uh, you know, when you don't play two traditional bigs, like those numbers are going to slip and they did. Um, but eventually, you know, having a stretch four out there banging home threes, like that obviously became a big thing, um, especially in the game against Baylor until Brady, you know, had to leave because of that elbow. And then the other thing he did that ran counter to Roy is, um, you know, last year Caleb Love played most of his minutes as the lead guard. Yep. And Caleb Love is an, 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 a really nice talent. And obviously a big shot maker, big shot taker, not afraid of the moment, not afraid of any moment, not afraid of missing like 11 of 15. You know, he's going to take his shots. And, you know, Hubert wanted to have two quote unquote point guards on the floor. That's the way he's described it. I think part of, I think that's partially true. Like I'll take him at his word. I think what's also true is he decided we got to get the ball to Caleb Love's hands. Right. And, and let him play off the ball, catch and shoot, catch and bounce it, shoot it. But, like, we don't need him bringing the ball up the court because for every time he does get us into what we want to get into, he's just going to take a wild shot. Yep. And, and that, like, again, Roy Williams had these same two players last year, and he played Caleb Love as the lead guard. Hubert this year decided we're going to put RJ at the one. Caleb, we'll call Caleb our second point guard, but he's, he's going to be a two guard, you know, playing off the ball. And it obviously has worked brilliantly. And, you know... I couldn't be happier for the guy because when you are a head coach for the first time and it's not going well at a program like North Carolina and you're starting to get criticized, not just by people around the country, but by your own fan base, people who otherwise love you. I can't imagine that's easy. And, you know, in fact, I'm, I'm a hundred percent sure it's, it's not, but he stayed positive the whole time, you know, um, you know, with it, by all accounts with his team, but just in general, and, and now he's coaching for a national championship on Monday night in his first year as a head coach. It is an, an incredible story, and I mean this sincerely. I'm not sure it could happen for a, a nicer human. And credit to, to North Carolina's defense, too. Um, after the game, Hubert, Hubert Davis is talking about how they wanted to slow Duke in transition. They wanted to get Duke to, to take and try and make contested shots. Well, Duke is not a very good three-point shooting team this season. In fact, they kind of live around the rim. Mark Williams had foul trouble Duke had to try and live taking shots on the perimeter. Ended up finishing 5 of 22 from three-point range. Felt like that, along with Mark Williams's uh, foul trouble and Theo John, just Hall of Fame-level foul trouble uh, early in this game was, I mean, uh, four, four fouls in like, 12 seconds it was ridiculous and you know um, what i didn't i didn't even mind that too much because it's like uh -huh. you know you would never under normal circumstances leave a guy in with three fouls in the first half but it was like this is you know we're in the final four and yeah. if theo john picks up his fourth like what is it really matter? we just got to steal minutes we got to steal minutes with him on court best we can and so i actually agreed with the way k handled that like if, if we foul yeah. out theo in the first half fine but that's better than you know mark williams picking up another foul in the first exactly Exactly. Um, and, and to me, I think I think that was kind of the difference is, is North Carolina was able to kind of rally its defense and make just enough big shots down the stretch. This was um, this was an epic performance, I think, from for North Carolina, from Hubert Davis. It was really incredible to see them. I mean, on this stage in his first year, uh, Duke, North Carolina, I mean, just everything about this game feels like it kind of just lived up to the hype. It, it was it was awesome. I mean, we were on. It's sort of interesting the way we were watching it. We had to watch like maybe the last eight minutes or so uh, on set because we, the way the contract is written, I guess I've never seen the contract. I'm just this is third hand information. But we I'll are contra co co we're contractually obligated, uh, not obligated, allowed to start our show as soon as the game is over. Um, but we have to wait for the game to be over. But we're trying to start as soon as the game's, you know, as soon as we can after the game's over. So we all have to watch the game outside on our set on some TVs. And those TVs have the raw feed straight from CBS. And, you know, so that's right in front of us. We're watching. Right behind us is a massive sports bar. Like we're right there on Fulton Street by Harris Casino. And there's a big sports bar with giant TVs, like right behind us. And because we had the raw feed from CBS, and, you know, they were, like, watching on 
you know, direct TV or however they watch, they're like a minute behind us. And so like Caleb Love would hit a three on our TV and, and you would hear like on our little set, ooh, is something like that. And then a minute later, you would hear, ah, like from behind us. It was like wild thing. So some people started like who were in between started figuring out. And they were like, dude, if we watch this little TV on this set, we'll find out what happened <laughs> like a long time before these other guys do. Uh, but it was interesting to watch the final minutes of that game in that way because you would have this moment and then you'd go, all right, just wait for it. This place is about to explode in 30 seconds. And then yes. it would just explode in 30 seconds. So it, it you know, uh, trust me, what you watched in person translated to TV. It was just an awesome scene, an all-time great um, national semifinal. And again, like – you know how quickly for we forget UCLA Gonzaga last year was an incredible national semifinal with the Jalen Suggs shot. But I do wonder if um, with all of the stakes here, like Mark few Mick Cronin, they're playing in a national, nobody's career was over. You know, this one was going to, you could end coach K's career and you could do it as the North Carolina Tar Heels. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure we'll rank them someday. If, you know, like in August of 2027, but um, I, I I think you could make the case that what we just experienced was the best national semifinal in college basketball history. A couple more things on this, and then we'll move on. Um, I know it's going to be a talking point, so let's just address it. It did not appear that the Duke players, all of them, shook hands the way you would normally do it uh, after a game. A lot of them went straight to the locker room, um, I want to give credit to Wendell Moore. It appeared that he did go through the handshake line, but like he really might have gone through the handshake line as a player by himself. Uh, credit to Coach K. Not that anybody deserves credit for doing the right thing, but uh, there's clear video evidence of him standing on the court, you know, seeking out North Carolina players, like shaking hands. Like he handled all of that, you know, as well as I think you could handle it. But, you know, if you're somebody out there wondering or tweeting, well, what are you going to say about the Duke players leaving the court without shaking North Carolina's players' hands? Well, here, I'm saying something about it. I thought it was wrong and embarrassing and uh, not the biggest thing in the world. I don't want to overstate it. I don't want to – I never want to be the old guy sitting on YouTube going, uh, and I can't believe those young guys didn't shake hands. Yeah, like They would have never done that in my day. I, you know, I, I'm never going to be – it's not the biggest deal in the world. But um, losing gracefully is, um, is, is something that's a good quality. And for the second straight time that Duke lost to North Carolina, there has been some sort of handshake line issue, which, again, it just doesn't reflect well. But uh, Wendell Moore did well and handled it well, and, and, and Coach K did. Uh, it, it appeared, too. And then we carried the postgame press conference live on CBS Sports Network with K and the players. And I thought K was pretty good there, like composed. Mm -hmm. it, it, from what I could see, he didn't have this, like, big moment of reflection or – you know, anything that's going to be played for, you know, every year, the next 50 years. But he was like, you know, I, you know, I've done this for a long time, you know, and he, he acknowledged, I think I'll miss it, but I did it for a long time. And he obviously did longer than almost, you know, anybody else will ever do it. Like, I really don't think it's an overstatement to say going forward, we might not find it. There, there might not be anything like this ever again. Um, there's too much pressure now. Guys are making too much money. As has been said a million times in this era of basketball, K might not have ever made it to like year four or year three or whatever it is. And so um, we might not ever see anything like this again. And the, the main thing I noticed from their Duke's postgame press conference, whether it was uh, Trevor Kills or, or Apollo, um, they seemed in shock almost. Like, mm -hmm. like, because they didn't think this was going to be their last game. And yep. with, with 80 seconds to go, I think with like 61 seconds to go, they were actually leading the game. And then it's like Caleb Love knocks down a shot. You miss one foul, free throws, miss another one, free throws, the game's over. What just happened? They were up at half. They were up, you know, a good portion of the second half. Um, and they were up with barely a minute, a little more than a minute left. And then it's just over. And that's one of the things that's always struck me about this is um, how abruptly – it can end for you. It's just like, hey, this is going well. Oh, all right. Uh, two minutes to go. We're ahead. We're headed to the title game. Nope. It's over. Your college career, if you're one of these one and dones, is done. Um, Coach K's career, it's over. Just the abruptness with which this stuff happens is has always been interesting to me. 
Yeah, yeah, and Duke and Duke had a chance down the stretch. Trevor Keels was driving. Uh, UNC fouled. He made a, a basket. It was in the NBA would have counted. He would have had an and one. Would have had a chance to make the free throw and, and potentially tie the game. That was not the case. Um, just felt like down the stretch, North Carolina had kind of. It wasn't just they caught the breaks, but they made the big shots. Duke didn't. Uh, Duke struggled from the th- from the free throw line. Uh, That was really costly for them down the stretch. Um, And North Carolina was just able to come up with, with enough defensive stops. And and to me, I think that was, that was kind of the combination of of all of that. It was the difference. I was standing um, almost exactly where I am now when I saw the, the handshake line thing kind of pop up to, from my, from my vantage point um, almost immediately as this game ended, North Carolina players just sprinted over to this other side of the court and there's a huge North Carolina contingent like right here and just fist pumping, like just yelling. Caleb Love was over here. Hubert Davis came over here and was like pumping up the Carolina fans. It didn't feel like Duke players just like bounced because Carolina players like didn't come to the handshake line either. They just sprinted right over here, but poor taste. It does feel like it. Duke, has a tendency to do these type of things uh they've done it before so i kind of feel like they don't get the benefit of that 